Our first speaker in this session comes from Minnesota. We just had a conversation that Minnesota is awesome. In the summers, we highly recommend to visit it. And Kate Warden is a senior engineering manager at Target Corp and founder at Developer First, and she is gonna talk about leading without authority. Kate, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here in this absolutely beautiful venue, probably the most beautiful one I've ever spoken at, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm excited to talk today about leading without authority, because I think it's a topic that will hopefully resonate with everyone in this room, whether you're um, a formal leader or you want to lead without authority. So the first thing I get to talk about is, why am I here? And so I'll go through a couple reasons to start off this presentation for why I'm here, talking about this subject today. The first thing I'd like to talk about is my mom. Um, she's, you know, literally the reason why I'm on planet Earth today. Um, but I became a boss a couple years ago, and her and I were talking about this new role that I had taken on. And how actually confused she was, and a little actually a bit concerned, that I had taken on this role of a boss. And she's like, you know, I've had some really, really bad bosses. I just don't feel like it fits your personality. You know, they're those, you know, commanding people. They're all about authority. And that just doesn't seem like you. And so, you know, I assured her, you know, no, I think I can do this differently. I won't be those bosses that you've had in your experience. And so I wanted to take, you know, her message and her advice to heart. And so I started to do some research before I had formally taken on this role. And I found some research that shows, you know, as the saying goes, people don't leave jobs. Sometimes they leave managers. So in my mom's case, um, and I'm sure a lot of you have had those really horrible bosses that have actually led you to leaving that job, um, it does happen. And so these bad managers result in us leaving our roles that we might really love. And so in doing more of this research, I found a Gallup engagement study that showed that 50%, so half of people who responded, um, said that they had left a job to get away from a manager at some point in their career. And this was a pretty, pretty huge global study. So they looked at 27 million different employees in on 2.5 million teams in 195 countries. So I realized that it is a really global issue. The second reason, and I'm in software development, I know a lot of you are as well, um, but I think this goes for a lot of different industries as well. But I know that engineers are picky when choosing where to work these days. So looking at some stats here, um, and these are for the US, but I, I also know that they are global um, and they're relevant and the proportions are the same throughout the world. So they say that about 70,000 people will be graduating this year with computer science degrees or boot camps or getting into software development. However, there's going to be about 700,000 different open roles for software engineering careers in the United States. So that's a 10 time the amount difference of the amount of roles versus qualified candidates who are entering these roles. So as organizations, we know that we're really, really going to have a tough time making sure that people want to join our organizations because they're going to have a lot of options on where to work. So we have to figure out, you know, how do we stand out as preferred organizations to work for, and not only stand out, but figure out how to retain people and keep them happy in their roles. Especially knowing that retention is at an all-time low. Recent surveys show that one in three people are going to leave their job for whatever reason this year, um, and we just know that it's getting worse. And I know that we can't afford to ignore this, these retention reports um, and this data. It's really, really expensive. So $11 billion is lost annually due to employee turnover. And they actually say that 75% of these causes are actually preventable, in my opinion, by great leaders and great bosses. And the third reason is that I found that a lot of people, when they become a manager or boss for the first time, aren't getting that formal training. So in this room, just raise your hand if you did get some formal training when you first became a manager at your organization. OK, that's actually more than I usually see in an audience, but I'd, I'd say probably about 40%. Um, so good for your organization for providing that to you. But that means that 60%, so the majority of us, are left just to figure it out on our own. And as we're making that career change, like I truly call it a career change, you're going from you know, computer science or whatever science to people science, like leading people. We just have to figure it out on our own. And so to recap the three reasons why I'm here, you know, number one, I know that people are leaving bad managers. 
Number two, I know that people have a lot of options on ch when choosing where to work. And then number three, I know that a majority of these new leaders are feeling really unprepared when they start their roles for the first time. So I want to transition into, like, why do bosses get a bad rap? I think a lot of things naturally stem from the media we're exposed to when we don't have that formal training. It's like parenting, like you, you know, if you don't have formal training, if it's your first time, you just kind of do what feels naturally to you. So there's those degrading leaders that we just emulate when we, you know, get in these really hard situations for the first time. Um, or you can just be really cruel and cold as a leader for the first time if you don't have that formal training. There's also some really admirable tech companies who are taking strong stances by just removing managers um, and seeing what happens then. I think another reason why bosses get a bad rap is sometimes we promote our best individual contributors who really shouldn't be people leaders. And I am a huge believer that those skills that made you an awesome engineer, accountant, whatever, are not gonna make you an awesome leader of those people. I love this quote by the former VP of People Operations at Google. Um, you know, we always believe that to be a manager, you have to be as deep or deeper of a technical expert than the people who work for you. But it turns out that's absolutely the least important thing. So we could just give up and get rid of managers. Um, the company that I admire most, they test these things out and then they report back to us so that we don't have to do it ourselves. So they ran one of their businesses without managers, and they did a study on it called Project Oxygen, and they found that without managers, people were left searching for basic answers to questions and needs, as well as guidance in important areas such as career advice. So those are like the foundations of being a successful person at work um, before we even want to stretch and grow even further. So without managers, I think we're pretty doomed. All right, so I think we're here to stay in worst organizations after seeing these facts and seeing how vital it is for leaders to be in our organizations. And so what I'm realizing is that we have to think differently about leadership. To make sure that we can solve these important problems that I've laid out for you now, we have to number one, develop awesome leaders, that's you. We have to foster irresistible cultures. And we have to make sure that we equip those new leaders with the tools, the training, the framework, and the confidence to be great leaders. Okay, so then I want to touch a little bit about, like, what does it mean, really, to lead without authority? And what is this new phrase that's, you know, really trending and becoming popular? I think to start with, you know, the old command and control style of leadership is very outdated. Um, and fortunately, hopefully in your organizations, those leaders don't last too long. And so the goal of leading without authority is to really get others to willingly cooperate and engage, and rather than just follow um, directives just because you are the boss. And so that's really what it means to me to lead without authority. So how do we do this? I want to get really, really tactical and make sure you have some things to leave with to implement in your organizations and on your teams tomorrow. So I'm going to go through seven different ways to practice leading without authority. Number one is to remove blockers that prevent people from making progress towards professional and personal goals. I think one of the most important roles of yourself as a manager, especially as a software manager, um, is to enable people to be as productive as possible, right? And so part of this does mean being that person that's removing blockers. So for me, in all of my one-on-ones with the team members, I'm making sure that I'm collecting a list of things that I can help them with and not the other way around. And so this has been as simple as changing the way I'm asking questions. So what can I help you with instead of, do you have a status update on X, Y, and Z? That's not really helpful in removing their blockers. That's just getting status updates, which we can do via email or Slack or whatever it may be. I also like to touch on onboarding when it comes to removing blockers, because it is so essential to set people up for success when they first start day one, to try to minimize those blockers that may come up. So some onboarding tips. Number one is to really discuss the roles and responsibilities of both the new hire and yourself as the leader. I also like to dis discuss the team ways of working. So it's okay to work from home on certain days, or here are our core hours that we, you know, have committed to being in the office. Also provide an overview of that team and project and where it sits within the organization. 
So I'm at Target Corporate, which is a very, very large organization, and it can feel really intimidating coming into you know, the small team and not really knowing how we fit. And so I like to draw out diagrams of, you know, here's our team, here's where it fits into the organization. I also like to make sure that I'm matching the new hire with a peer buddy and a mentor. And I think these are very different roles. Um, so that peer buddy is the person who they can go to for any reason, ask any question, not feel stupid to ask them questions with unbiased responses. And then the mentor is that technical person who's gonna help them level up their skills. Um, maybe they're the first person they go to for a code review, et cetera. Next is to help that person build a social network. Again, at Target, it's really big, and I like to make sure I'm connecting people with those core partners right away so that they feel comfortable and it feels like a smaller world for them. And then lastly, I like to ask the person what they prefer for a welcome celebration. I've learned the hard way that not everyone wants a happy hour. Um, some people want donuts, they just maybe want a board game lunch, um, maybe they don't want anything. So make sure you're asking that person what they prefer for their unique welcome celebration and don't assume um, that the norms of the organization will necessarily fit their wants. I also wanna make sure I touch on that developer onboarding because it's so essential. There's nothing worse than showing up on your first day and like not even having a laptop. So let's make sure we get them productive right away. Um, and that's covering like, what are all those access requests that they need? Um, are we setting, can we show them how to set up their development environment on day one? That's a huge win. Um, can you draw architectural diagrams so they can understand how the technology fits into everything? What is your release process so that that's not such an intimidating process when they go through it for the first time? Is that documented? And also just walk through all the other miscellaneous developer tools. Maybe some are new to them if they haven't used them at previous um, locations or organizations. Another thing that is essential in leading without authority is making sure that you can watch out for blockers in disguise. So I've noticed that blockers can disguise themselves as unique dynamics on the team. And so this is where it's really, really important that you have that emotional intelligence as a leader to pick up on those things. So if you see their interpersonal issues, you have to be the one to bring those up as the leader. So don't sit on things, make sure you address it with those people who might be impacted or might be contributing to the issue. Number two is to always empower your team. And here, the basic lesson that I like to say is just ensure that dis decisions are made at the level where the best information is available. And this can be really, really hard at organizations when we have you know, hierarchies of leaders and individual contributors, but I always like to make sure that we're asking the people on the front line when we're making core decisions. Has anyone ever heard of the iceberg of ignorance? Yeah, it's like a 1980s business term, but it's so, it's so effective and it's, it's so essential to really understanding how to empower a team. Okay, so the iceberg of ignorance basically shows and proves that a lot of those pains and those problems are not known to top level leadership. Um, so they say, you know, 4% of problems are known to those top managers, 9% are known to middle management like myself, which is still really, really low percent. And then obviously 100% of problems are known to those frontline employees who are actually trying to solve the problems every day and going through those problems every day. And so this can be really, really expensive and it just doesn't seem logical to not include those people when we're trying to solve those problems. Okay, so how do we melt the iceberg? I think the first thing and the big thing is to be humble. So what does it mean to be humble? I think we have to make sure that we're seeking to understand pain points via maybe anonymous pulse surveys, um, which can be really, really easy to get feedback quickly um, where people feel comfortable to share their mind about those problems. Um, keep your office door open, you know, metaphorically, if you're, if you're a remote team, make sure that you are extremely approachable as a leader for people to come to. Hopefully you can sit with a team to pick up on these problems firsthand. Also just ask people, you know, how can I help you do your job better or help you enjoy your job more? I also like to do stay interviews. So has anyone heard of an exit interview? It's kind of like, you know, yeah, when the person is leaving the company, you know, why are you leaving? Is there anything we can do to improve this for other people? Like, why don't we do that before they leave the company? Um, so have a stay interview, you know, for those people who are at your company, say, hey, if you were to leave tomorrow, what would the number one reason be? 
Okay, so but in general, when we're looking at decisions, let's figure out, you know, who should participate in making this decision. Let's bring along the right people who are really feeling the pain and have the best perspective. Who's gonna have to carry it out? Like, who's gonna have to carry out the results of this decision? And then also, who's gonna be impacted by the results of this decision? I love this quote by Steve Jobs. You know, it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and just tell them what to do. We hire smart people so that they can tell us what to do. You know, especially in technology when there's new versions and frameworks and everything's modern and new, there's no way I can keep up to date on everything. And so as a manager, I just have to empower my team and make sure that I'm looking to them for the answers to this and helping them just make sure that they are being creative and building these solutions. I also like to say, you know, as an empowering leader, make sure you're waiting for conversations to play out. This can be especially challenging if you were an engineer or an individual contributor on the team before you became a manager, because you know the ins and the outs. You're a domain expert, and people look to you for those decisions. However, now that you're a leader, it's essential that you wait for conversations to play out and let the team come up with those solutions instead of looking to you all the time. Has anyone read the book Multipliers? Okay, it's a really good book, yep. Um, okay, and so Liz Wiseman talks about two different types of leaders. The first is a multiplier, and that's the people who multiply the genius around them. And then there's diminishers who diminish the brilliance around them because they're always the ones to bring up you know, solutions and everyone always looks to them for solutions, but they're really just diminishing the, you know, the brilliance around them and on their team members. So I love this quote that she has in the book, you know, multipliers get more from their people because they are leaders who look beyond their own genius and focus their energy on extracting and extending the genius of others instead. So be especially careful if you are that domain expert and you are leading a group of people. Make room for them to come up with new ideas and be part of those decisions. Now sometimes I have to acknowledge that it is impossible to push things to the team. And in these circumstances, I think it's just really, really vital that as leaders, we're providing context. So for me, sometimes that's context to the team. You know, hey, I know you really wanted to address this technical debt that's been a pain forever, but we just have to work on this business in initiative for this reason. Or maybe it's to other leaders, like, hey, we have to address this technical debt. It's gonna improve performance on the application, and here's why you care about that. So as the leader, you are the one to provide context whether it's to the team or to other leaders. But if I've learned anything, it's that context is huge to everyone, especially team members who might not hear all that information that you have access to. So as a leader, make sure that you're providing that context whenever possible. And the last point in this section is that leaders have to be really, really great simplifiers. You are bombarded by information all the time, all day, and it's super important that you're able to take like a huge memo length um, amount of words and make sure that it is in a one sentence consumable you know, update for your team. So you have to practice being a really, really great simplifier to get the people the information they need in a timely fashion. Number three is to share credit and take blame. The first thing, sharing credit, I always like to make sure that I'm trying to associate names with accomplishments, especially being at a large organization. People can really get lost, especially on a development team when they're working on features and we don't necessarily always get the recognition that we deserve. So let's try to associate names with accomplishments when possible. Another thing I've learned is that not all recognition looks the same. So I learned that you know, not everyone likes being recognized at an all-team meeting in front of 100 people for what they did, and some people really love that. You know, some people just prefer a direct message or me stopping by to tell them on an individual basis, like, hey, you did a really great job on this. So make sure that you ask people as they onboard your team what they prefer for recognition. Now the take blame piece. It is essential that you're loyal when recovering from an ugly failure as a leader. So in technology, you know, when there's issues, you're not bringing up names here, you're representing the team as the leader and helping them walk through the RCA afterwards to see what they can learn from it. But when you're talking to other leaders about what went wrong, it's always you representing the team and not pointing fingers at anyone else. 
Number four is to never devalue people in the process of delivering a solution. So we as leaders, you know we care about the results and we have to care about the results. We're accountable for what we deliver. But I also think you know, a bigger part of our job is to really enable people as developers. And I've learned that when it comes to humans, abstraction is bad. You know, we're not in assembly lines right now. Um, even those who are in assembly lines still in factories, you know, what someone can produce and what someone is worth at their work is a lot more than we can describe in simple numbers and metrics. So be really careful when you talk about, you know, annual performance reviews or just in your one-on-ones. Like, what are you talking about when you describe value? Is it the number of lines of code they delivered or the number of JIRA stories they closed? Or is it what, did they mentor someone? Did they provide other value in other ways that are you know, easier to talk about? Um, actually, it's harder to talk about, I should say. You know, metrics are a lot easier to talk about, but do the right thing and the hard thing by talking about those soft skills where they're actually like multiplying the value of the team. And also, as a leader, make sure you're setting expectations of what those values are. So if your values are, you know, closing the most Jira stories, then that's fine. But make sure that also if you do value people mentoring others um, and spreading knowledge, like you talk about that as you're onboarding people onto your team, you're establishing clear expectations before the end of the year review, and you're providing frequent feedback to how they're doing throughout the year. I love this quote, you know, tell me how you measure me, and then I'm gonna tell you how I behave. And I have found that to be totally true. If I'm only measuring you by the lines of codes that you're gonna deliver, that's all you're gonna care about. Not about quality, not about performance, not about helping others. Look at what you're incentivized by on your team and make sure that, you know, your words are aligned with your actions. Another thing is to make sure that you understand what motivates each unique person on your team, because these are very, very, very different. Um, I could talk for an hour about motivation and all the intrinsic and extrinsic motivations and how people react differently to different types of feedback, but make sure that at a minimum you're just understanding, you know, hey, what, what motivates you? Like, when do you get energy at work? Um, you know, what makes you excited to come to work? Ask that of each person on your team. One of my favorite books, especially being new to management, is Radical Candor. Um, I love that she really just demystifies the art of giving feedback. Um, but so in this book, Kim Scott says, your job is to not provide purpose, but instead get to know each of your direct reports well enough to understand how they derive meaning from their work. The next lesson here is to celebrate and also reap the benefits of the unique characteristics of every individual on your team. There are so many studies about diversity and inclusion and how important and vital it is to being on a team. And I truly believe that you know, there are so many unique ways that people learn and think and approach their work and honestly just see the world. And so it's super important as a leader that we're understanding and really embracing these topics. If you're a numbers person, I'll give you some stats now. Um, so 67% of job seekers consider workplace diversity an important factor when choosing where to work. 50% of people want their current workplaces to be more diverse. And then organizations with above average gender diversity and levels of employee engagement outperform companies with below average diversity and engagement by 46 to 58%. So financially, it's also logical to have diverse teams. And so as leaders, we do have to ensure that everyone feels comfortable to arrive at work every day, and that also we're doing everything we can to get a diverse set of team members on our teams and in our organizations. I found that you know, people are gonna bring their whole human self to work, even if they try not to, and instead of finding ways to fit in and spending their energy on that, you know, I love how Yvette said, you know, I can be an activist on my own time, but I shouldn't have to be an activist every single day at, with, at work. That's so draining. Like, let's make sure people feel comfortable every single day at work without question so that they can instead build, you know, spend that energy building awesome technology, right? A quick tip that I learned the hard way, um, make sure you're finding out what those religious or cultural days and holidays are significant to the team members if they're not common and already celebrated and already you know, given vacation time for. Do not reach out to someone on a holiday if they are celebrating it. So figure out what those are. Even if you can't offer them vacation time off, make sure that you're not disrupting them. 
also like to talk about how this lack of diversity on engineering teams has also failed us in other ways. So whether it's from facial recognition software to crash tests, like it's actually killing people. Um, and I think that's because of, you know, this lack of diversity on these core engineering teams. And I have a hypothesis for why this happens. I think, you know, building, problem, building products to solve a problem is all about creativity. And I love this quote about creativity and this definition that creativity is making unexpected connections between things that we already know. And so what if our teams were made up of the exact same person with similar experiences and backgrounds? You know, if we all had the same experiences, our ability to be, build creative solutions and really foster creativity is just gonna go down significantly. And so then the quality of our work is definitely affected by our degree of diversity on our teams because the range of possible solutions to an engineering problem will be significantly smaller on these non-diverse teams. And so that's why it's important for many reasons to make sure that we're fostering, fostering diverse and inclusive teams. The next lesson is to be vulnerable and authentic. And the first thing here is to make sure that you're articulating your stories of struggle as a leader. And so this is where it's really important to be, you know, humble and transparent and vulnerable, which are really, really hard things to just like flip a switch when you become a boss, but it's so vital to do as a leader to really lead first in these situations. So for me, that means, you know, talking about the times that I've personally failed, whether it's going through a similar solution or a similar problem that they're going through. Um, we also have a weekly team huddle where all my teams come together, and I always start it with TIL. So, you know, it's usually today I learned, but I do this week I learned. And so every, every week we have people share, you know, maybe something that they felt was really stupid or like, oh, I made this huge mistake. I hit my head against the wall for three hours trying to figure out React hooks. Like, what did you do this week that you want to share with others? And so I always try to start with something that I messed up on just to make sure that I'm being vulnerable and authentic to kick off the meeting. Now along the lines of being authentic. I was shocked to learn that this is my dad's LinkedIn profile picture. So he is a software consultant, you know, he's always working with recruiters trying to find the next gig. Um, and I was like, how do people take you seriously? Like, would anyone hire him with picture Mr. Ed as his profile picture? And of course, he gets hired all the time. Um, and so when I asked him, you know, why, why do you think that's okay and not super unprofessional? He said, you know, I don't wanna work for a company that can't take my sense of humor and can't accept my authentic self. And so that has been a huge learning for me, you know, not only as I'm looking at organizations that I wanna work for and teams and bosses who I wanna work for, but also as a leader and as I'm trying to recruit and hire people, like I wanna make sure that they can also say the same thing about my team. Especially knowing those stats that I told you earlier, people have 10 times the amount of options you know, than the amount of people who are coming into these roles. So make sure you're really embracing every authentic person on your team to be the authentic selves. Number six is to prioritize and focus. And this is a little bit more dry of a topic, but it is essential as a leader to make sure that your time management skills are up to par and that you're able to prioritize and focus on the right things. So I've done a lot of research on this um, and reading about, you know, the greats, the great experts of success, you know, when asked one thing to define their success, you know, what's that one word that if you could share and impart knowledge on others, they said focus. You know, we are so bombarded with meetings and conversations and fire drills that it is so vital that we're able to focus on the thing that's on the most fire right now. Like, what is the most important thing that you need to be focusing your attention and time on? So you have to figure out, you know, how do I figure out what matters at any given moment? Which team member needs the most help right now that would, you know, deliver the most value to help them through? Or which business partner is really, really angry at us that I need to go meet with and, and you know, settle, settle down? So make sure that as a leader, you are trying to figure out what you should be focusing your energy on. A couple other tips of advice for time management. Um, number one is to stop multitasking on those important tasks. 
it causes a 10% drop in IQ and leads to as much of a 40% drop in productivity. So obviously there's a time and a place for multitasking, you know, those things you can do in your sleep that you don't necessarily have to focus a lot of attention on. Um, but don't focus, you know, don't multitask those important things. So don't have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with a team member on the phone, you know, while you're reading emails at the same time or don't be writing performance reviews while you're watching The Office. Like, just try to make sure that you're really focusing on the things that matter and not multitasking on those really, really vital things. I said this was dry, I promise it'll be fast, um, but let's talk about email. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of you get a lot of email, your leaders and your managers, um, so I try to really prioritize keywords that indicate urgency. Um, and hopefully, you know, your partners are, are doing a good job to do this in, your, in their subject lines, but really prioritize those types of emails. Um, also look for possibilities to unblock team members. I said, you know, in number one, that this is also a vital part of our job. Finding ways to unblock team members to really be productive is vital as a leader. And then also look at messages who are only addressed to you. You can't assume someone else is gonna handle it. Like, make sure that you're um, addressing those types of emails as well. And then there's nothing worse than a long email chain where you have to read through like three days of conversations and then try to come up with your response. Like just suggest a quick call for everyone who's on that email chain. Next is calendar. You know, calendars exist to organize and communicate. They are not the enemy. So what I like to do is scan my calendar on Fridays and first thing in the morning and look at all the meetings that I'm being requested to attend. Are there any meetings that I can skip or cancel or send a proxy? You know, sometimes it can be really cool to say, hey, you know, engineer, you, you have expressed interest in this, in this topic. Like, would you want to go to this meeting for me? And it's a win-win because then I don't have to go and then they can go and learn about that conversation and, you know, make sure that they're creating a reputation for themselves as well. Are there meetings that engineers are invited to that they could be considered optional? Make sure you're making that clear so that you're not wasting the time of a lot of people if they won't really get value out of it or if they won't provide value to that conversation. Also make sure that there aren't several meetings in a day that really drain your energy. Sometimes this is hard, you know, because other people are organizing the calendar, um, but try to really protect your time and not be completely de-energized um, by some of these types of conversations. And on the flip side, make sure that there's some meetings, at least every week, that really energize you. So what are those topics that you get excited to talk about? Um, make sure that you at least are carving out some time to attend those types of meetings. This one is also frequently missed, but make sure you're blocking time for traveling, for lunch, for bathroom breaks. Like, a lot of calendars are just packed from the start of the day to the end of the day, but let's be realistic and try to block time for that unplanned work. Now about meetings. The first tip that I give any new manager is if you really, really, really hate meetings, you should consider if, the, in, if you are in the right role because they are inevitable at most organizations. But when you are attending meetings, make sure that you are making and sharing an agenda, identifying the purpose of that meeting so that people know what they're coming to, know that they're sending the right people, know that they are the right people to be attending that. I also like to make sure I'm repeating that at the start of the meeting so that we're all on the same page and we're not, you know, talking about different things or trying to get different outcomes out of that conversation. Also, there's nothing worse than people just sharing updates back and forth, like let's just use technology for that. If it's not a true conversation, let's not have a meeting about it. Also, look at the timing of meetings, especially when developers are involved. So I like to say, you know, developers work in four hour chunks, like it's impossible to get into a code base in like 15 or 30 minutes in between meetings. So look at what time you're scheduling meetings with the team. Hopefully it's at the start of the day or, you know, the end of the day so that they do have that productive time to really work and get into the code. And then also make sure you're capturing action items. So again, there's nothing worse than being like, okay, we had this great conversation, and a week later, nothing's come of it. Like, who's responsible for doing what? I can't remember. So if you're owning the meeting, make sure you capture action items by saying, you know, here's the owner and here's the verb. Like, what are they expected to do by when? I love this Eisenhower matrix, so it's a great way if you have a huge pile of to-dos to organize them. Um, so by, you know, importance and then also urgency. And my favorite category is the not important and not urgent. Like, let's just be realistic. You're probably never going to do that. So get it off your list and make sure that it's not clouding your mind for all those important things that you actually should do, maybe urgently. Has anyone ever said this to their boss or had this said to them? Yes. 
You know, I think it actually means and translates into like, I'm trying to do or think about too many priorities at the same time, or I don't have the proper resources or support. So when you're saying I'm overwhelmed or when you hear that from, you know, a direct report, really look into and dig into what they need, like what can you help them with? Um, because saying I am overwhelmed could mean a lot of different things. So I like to try to translate phrases like that. I also love to say, you know, when you say yes to something, you are saying no to something else because we only have so much time in the day. Everyone has the same amount of time and it's limited and there's so many distracting things that can come up that could be exciting to work on. But if you look at your core responsibilities as a leader and there's too many things that are distracting your time and taking you away from those core responsibilities, just really assess that um, and audit yourself from time to time. Ah, yourself, that leads right into it. Um, okay, so I have this tool on my website and it looks at, you know, what are you doing now? Like, how are you breaking out your times versus what is your ideal proportion of time spent? So I think it's cool to have people look at their calendar the past two weeks and be like, okay, where am I spending my time? Versus how do I ideally want to be spending my time? And then go and make sure you're adjusting. So I encourage you to do that activity. Number seven, and the last tip here, is to make sure that you're always investing in your communication skills as a leader. One-on-ones. So when I first became a boss, I would just absolutely dread one-on-ones. I felt like it was up to me to do all the preparation and all the talking, like sharing updates, sharing feedback. It was so draining. And so what I quickly realized was that you know, this isn't about me. This is about the team member and what they need, and so they should do most of the talking. So if I have one tip for you, be quiet, ask questions. You should not be doing most of the talking as the leader in a one-on-one. -on -one. So let's look at, you know, why do we have one-on-ones? I think it's to, number one, take a pulse on that person or the team to uncover potential issues. So if you're not able to be present, you know, sitting with the team all the time, one-on-ones are an essential way to get a pulse of what's really going on. Is there anything that I should be concerned about? What can I be helping with? They're also had to make sure we're fostering trust amongst team members and gaining alignment, you know, explain to them why we're working on certain initiatives if they're confused about things or, you know, have them explain to you why they're working on what they are doing or what they're enjoying about it. It's also used to give feedback. Um, again, we could talk about feedback forever, so I just encourage you to research that topic and how to give really great feedback as a leader. Um, you, maybe you're discussing career direction, so where do you want to go next? You know, what are you working towards that I can help you with? And then, like I said before, it's all about providing context. Why are we here, what are we working on, and why are we working on it? But my number one tip, as I alluded to in the one-on-one -on -one intros, is to just stop talking as a leader and instead ask questions. And this means being a really, really great listener. Amy said before, you know, don't have your cell phone on, and if you are taking notes, communicate that. There's nothing worse than, you know, being in a meeting with someone and they're clearly distracted. Um, so don't have your laptop out, don't have your notes out, unless you can tell them what you're doing and that you are really paying attention. I've had those meetings where, you know, someone was clearly just not, you know, mentally present. And so I said, hey, you know, this is an important conversation to me. Like, do you mind if we have this at another time? It doesn't seem like you're necessarily here right now. And they really appreciated that I was open and said that. And at the same time, I also say that for my direct reports. So if we're in a one-on-one -on -one and I'm really distracted by something, I'll say, hey, I'm so sorry. I'm distracted by this. Like, I want to be completely mentally present because this is an important time for you. So can we meet, you know, in an hour or tomorrow once I have time to process this other thing that's on my mind? So make sure that you're just listening and being a really, really great listener. Other characteristics of great listeners they're focusing their attention on the other person without distraction. They're asking follow-up questions to make sure that the person knows they're actually listening and, and want to understand you know, what they're trying to say. They're paraphrasing and clarifying. They're observing the person's energy, mood, tone of voice. So do they have high or low energy talking about this topic? Like, are they, are they excited about this? Um, what are their body language and what are their gestures saying? Or what isn't being said here? A couple other questions that I like to ask at every single one of my one-on-ones one is, number one, what is on your mind? 
And this feels a little awkward at first, um, but I find it's really, really great because no one ever says nothing, um, except for my husband when I ask him this, um, but no team members say nothing. And I, I love this one because it says, you know, this question says, let's talk about what the most important thing is to you right now. I also like to say, you know, say more about that because I want to hear the context. I want them to try to describe it in a different way to make sure that it's resonating with me so that I can help them the best that I can. I always end all of my one-on-ones with, how can I help? So what can I do this week to help you with what you're trying to do? I also love this one because it's making a clear and direct request to what they need. I think a lot of our time is wasted, spent doing things we are assuming people need, and so let's just ask straight up, like, what do, I, what do you need, what can I help with? And then lastly, this is just kind of a fun one, you know, what is the most challenging or exciting thing that you're working on right now? So this is a great way to get them talking about, you know, what are they enjoying about their work? What challenges could you help them through? Um, or what challenges can you just make note of for something that they worked through, you know, on their annual performance review? So to wrap up, I truly believe, you know, that leaders don't provide the answers. Instead, they ask great questions to help empower that person and coach them to get to the answer themselves. So I want to end today just by saying that people are our most important assets at our organization. And so then we have to be tenaciously committed to the growth of every single individual on our team. And so let's, let's do everything to be the best leaders that we can and to lead without authority. Thank you so much. <laughs> We've got a lot of questions. That was great, and so many concrete examples. Let's get started. Mm -hmm. Hold on. We had a TV there, but now it's here. I gotta move out. <laughs> if top management only knows 4% of the issues, how do you, as middle management, influence the top management to allow decisions to be taken at a lower level? I think that we had this, Sean spoke to this yesterday. What do you think about it? Yeah, I think, um a great way to do this is, and I say data is bad, but data is really good sometimes. So collect data on those pain points. So like, if if you know top management saying, oh, we're wasting you know too much time um, refactoring this certain code base, I can say, hey, you know, last year you said that too, and look how long our development cycles took this year. Like. If you were to give us some time to refactor, I assure you, based on previous projects, that we would be able to speed it up by X, Y, and Z. So collect data you know, as much as you can so that you can speak to those metrics and speak to why those matter to top-level management. And also, it's important to like, speak their language, like you know, finances, cost, hours. Like, those, you know, they're high level, like those are things that are important to them as leaders. So translate you know, what those low-level problems are and what they really mean to leaders. So really like a concrete, evidence-based, Case. Yeah, yep. Okay, great. <clears throat> How to be a genius maker, wouldn't we like to know? Aww. How can you make geniuses from people? Oh my god, that's like a really deep question. It's a deep question. <laughs> um, I think, let's see, the first thing I like to do, like when meeting someone new <laughs> who's joining my team, is to figure out what energizes them because what energizes them is gonna be the easiest to really hone in on and that they're gonna feel um, like they just want to work on that and want to improve. It's not gonna feel like pulling teeth to improve this particular skill set or this genius. Um, that's what I look for first. Like, it's really hard to say, um, for example, like, test coverage is bad. Like, I want you to be a genius at writing tests. People aren't necessarily very passionate about that, so let's focus on the things that they are passionate about, like mentoring others um, in that form of genius. Okay, that's what okay, I great. <laughs> For good individual contributors, is it inevitable to become a manager? Can we foster leadership without oh. making them managers, just to not promote out of competence? Oh gosh, I love that question. Um, no, you should definitely not get into management if mm -hmm. you're an amazing individual contributor. Like, it's not inevitable to become a manager. I love when organizations have um, career paths where you can get you know, very high in the organization, get compensated without becoming an official people leader. So like at Target, we have levels where you can get like all the way up to the equivalent of a vice president as an individual engineer, which is super, super awesome. I think vital in, you know, modern and modern organizations where it's important to have that, you know, that knowledge and that depth of experience without switching to managing people because when you're managing people, you're, you're probably not spending much time coding anymore or doing, you know, whatever trade. It is. I know someone who, for whom that was really, really the case. Yeah. That's great feedback. Yeah. Okay. 
What do you think is a good ratio of tech skills oh. versus people skills as an engineering manager? Is there a good ratio? I think it really depends on the team. I've been on some teams where they, you know, it's a junior level team and they don't have necessarily those senior lead level engineers. So the engineering manager has to, you know, be very technical and be doing code reviews and be participating in that way. Versus some teams are, yeah, you, you could really get out of it and out of coding. Like I haven't coded in years um, because I've been on those teams with really, really strong technical leaders. And so I more handle the HR and, you know, the relationships and the politics of it. So it depends. I don't okay. have an answer. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk more about that during the break with her. Uh, when collecting action items for yourself in one-on-ones, how do you avoid becoming oh. the rescuer in Carpman's Drama Triangle? Very clear question. I don't know what Carpman's Drama Triangle is. Do you? But oh, I gosh. I'm s no. Okay. Well, I, I definitely can see the rest of the... Okay, so question master, <laughs> you need to find Kate and explain first the premise of your question. You do that. Yeah. Well, I can answer. I think I can answer... Um, because I think, yeah, there's one, thing, okay. there's one thing about saying, like, I will solve everything for you as a leader. Like, give me your problems and I will solve them. Like, no, that's definitely not. Um, it, you need to make sure that you're empowering people to solve it themselves if they can. So there's one, circ or like, a couple circumstances in which I'll say, oh, I'll go do that. And that's with, like, unblock, like, the things I talk about, like, unblocking, like, I'm going to go talk to that team because, like, it, I have to talk to them about other things. Or if it's something where they don't feel that inclusive environment, like, you know, this person said something to me that I am offended by, like, I don't want them to have to necessarily handle that. Gotcha. Um, so if it's sensitive or if it just makes more sense for me to handle it, yeah. But in most circumstances, like, it's just helping them get the answers so that they can go do it themselves independently. Okay, well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, yeah. that's all the time Second. we've got left. We've got a lot of questions, so please do track Kate down. Break time, lunchtime, afternoon. And Kate, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you so <laughs> much. Can you give me this? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. okay.